What is up everyone, it's Megido, and today, welcome to the follow-up of the SMT4 run that y'all been asking for. This time with a twist, that'll surely make me lose whatever sanity I have left from the Nocturne run, which the support for has been amazing, so thank you all very much. In case you only read the No Demon Whisper part, instead of doing it with default armor only, I decided to replace that with No Demon Deletion. Yeah, you heard me right. Now, why am I doing it like this? Well, because I felt like the SMT4 run was way too easy, despite the fact my natural defense was at its minimum and I couldn't use anything else aside from my basic physical attack and gun attack and magic item attacks. So instead of having it so I have to complete the game with default armor only, and because of how much I hate myself, I decided to make it so that I can't get rid of any demons I recruit, no matter how useless they are at any point in the game. I feel as though I don't need to explain anything on the Whisperless side, since the majority of what I could explain here was already discussed at SMT4, but what I should explain is what I mean by no demon deletion. Now, what classifies as demon deletion, and what doesn't? What falls under demon deletion is simply deleting a demon from your comp with the delete button, doing any form of fusion, or selecting dialogue options that Dogda agrees with, but doing a bait and switch at the last second in the Cosmic Egg. Since fusion makes two demons into one, that frees up a demon slot, so technically it deletes a demon, and because of that, fusion is completely banned. Also, uh, hitting the delete button to delete a demon? I shouldn't have to explain that. Now, what do I mean by the last thing I said that classifies as demon deletion? Throughout the entirety of Apocalypse, the majority of dialogue options you're presented actually does have some effect on what side you choose when you get to the end of the Cosmic Egg. If the majority of the dialogue options you selected is what Dogda agrees with, but you side with your friends at the last second, Dogda will straight up delete all your demons from your comp. So because that deletes demons, doing that bait and switch is banned. If you're wondering what happens when you do the vice versa of that, so basically saying everything your friends agree with but side with Dogda at the last second, yeah, Navar will just throw away all your items, so you could do that bait and switch because it doesn't delete demons, but I mean, why would you? Now, what doesn't fall under demon deletion is evolution, since it only gives you a more powerful version of that demon and it doesn't free up a slot. So because of that, demon evolution is allowed. Before I forget to mention it, buying the expand stock apps is still allowed since that will be our only way of getting new demons without deleting old ones. Because I can't delete demons, I'm going to have to be extremely extremely mindful of what demons I recruit, and since I don't have any controls over their movesets, the only form of control I can get is with Skill Augment, which allows your demons to mutate one of their skills, for better or worse. As for what difficulty I'm playing on, I decided to play on War Mode since that's the hardest difficulty I have access to. Also, I am going to be allowing the use of the grinding DLCs, however the only time I ever used it at all during the game was towards the end since that's the point of the game where regular grinding becomes slow and boring. Anyway, with all the explanations and the rules out of the way, let's get to the run. We hear a voice that oddly sounds familiar talking to us, then a guy who looks like Flynn in a black demonica suit appears and he strangely calls us Akiron. Why does that name sound familiar? Eh, before we can even question what we just saw, we are awoken by our friend Asahi. We then watch the news because we're bored, which talks about Flynn being Tokyo's liberator, and then we meet Nikari and Manabu, who send us out to collect relics. Among these relics, we find a smartphone so that we can summon demons, but Asahi tells us not to use without her, which is a very stupid thing to say given the circumstances, because what if I get fucking ambushed? Well, thankfully, we don't get ambushed, and the smartphone doesn't even work, so regardless, we'd be screwed. However, this is also where we get to insert our names, so like the basic bitch that I am, I just stick with whatever is filled in. We head back inside, and Nakari gives us a history lesson on how Tokyo got placed under the ceiling, and how the rest of the world just seemingly disappeared, never to be heard from again. Then we head to Keenstein's show to go to sleep and have another dream where we see the guy who looks like Flynn in a black demonica suit commit seppuku and we get called Akira once again. You know, whoever these guys are must be really important to the plot if we had two consecutive dreams about them. Before we could even comprehend what we just saw, we are rudely awakened by Asahi who tells us we need to get to the Hunters Association for the morning meeting. It's here where we meet Asahi's dad. Come on. If I said it once, I've said it a thousand times. Don't call you dad at work. Right, right, boss. 
Sorry. It's where we meet Boss, and then we talk to Nikari about her dream for last night, and Nikari tells us to not discuss the dream I had, since the hunters hate the name Akira for some reason. The meeting starts, and Skins and Fujiwara tells everyone that Merkaba and his angels are set up in the Sky Tower, Lucifer and his demons are set up at Camp Ichigaya, and us hunters are set in the Death Center. However, we are told that Flynn is going to deal with them. In case you couldn't already tell, this is taking place during SMT4's neutral ending. After the broadcast ends, we receive our first quest, which involves delivering food. We head out to Kinshi Park, where we finally have our first tutorial fight. The fight is very easy. Just exploit the enemy's physical weakness and you'll be done in no time. One thing you may notice is that unlike SMT4, you start out with a physical and a gun attack, so from the start, I'm going to be prioritizing a dexterity build. After another fight with this pig demon, we head back to Nakari to complete the tutorial, but then we get ambushed by Adramalek, where Nakari and Manabu proceed to get fucking incinerated, and Nanashi soon follows. Yeah, Nanashi fucking dies before the game even starts. After dying a slow and painful death, we wake up in this weird otherworldly place where the only path is forward and head towards the light, where we are then introduced to Irish Terminator. Dogda tells us, in case it wasn't already obvious, that we're dead. He gives us two choices. He can resurrect us in exchange for us becoming his godslayer, or we can just reject his offer and let the events of SMT4's neutral ending play out. If you've seen how long this video is, I think what we chose should be obvious. Upon accepting his offer, we gain 120 experience, which gives us three levels, to which we dump every stat point into dexterity, and then we come back to life to show Adra Malik a proper rematch. It's here where we gain access to the first ever demon of the run, that of which being a centaur. For this fight, all you have to do is just spam Bufu and shoot your gun at him until he gets bored and runs away like a little sissy baby. After we save Asahi from being burned alive, we talk to Boss about what happened and get our next quest, which is to recruit some demons. Now we are at the point where we have to be extremely mindful about what we're doing, as recruiting a demon that is not going to be useful at any point in the run can really dick us over. We head to the Kinshisho Stopping District and recruit Kodama, who has Zeo, and Legion, who has Lunge of Dream Needles. After that, we get a message that has us go to the Sky Tower to rescue Hunters from Angels, and this is where we start having problems. Immediately when the fight starts, this angel kills my Legion with Hama, which she is weak to, and the rest of my demons follow suit, leaving Nanashi to fend for himself. Now, I could continue the fight, but there really isn't a point, since I know I won't survive the next encounter. So, I reset the game and go out to recruit two more demons, out of which being Strigoi and Porwit, then I go back to attempt the fight again, and... things aren't much better. I find out that she has an electricity and dark weakness, but that doesn't seem to matter because she takes out Legion with Hama, which I expected. Then she takes out my Porwit, leaving me with only Nanashi and Sudama. I know I have Strigoi and Centaur in reserve, but I knew bringing them out wouldn't make a difference because I knew both of them would be killed regardless, which would just bring us back down to two party members, if at worst, one. What also doesn't help is that Angel has Dia, which heals off more damage than what we're dealing. And we don't have any reliable healing either, because sometimes when we need healing, Asahi's demons won't obey, which is something I didn't even know could happen. So, my second attempt, I just rage quit the fight and turn to the only viable strategy, which is just getting lucky. However, I quickly go to the shop to buy heavy rounds and the crimson armor for extra defense with the sweet bonus of fire resistance. Then, I go back to try the fight again, and I actually start getting the look I need. Instead of bringing Legion out, I replace him with Centaur so that no one in my party has a weakness that she can take advantage of. Now that she doesn't have a weakness to take advantage of, I can now outdamage her Dia thanks to the extra press turns. She does take out Porwit at the end of the fight, but it doesn't really matter, as one more Zeo Stone was enough to cut this Angel down. Now that we finally defeated Angel, we can finally move on to... Oh, motherfucker. Yeah, the next encounter I mentioned earlier is Haniel, and if you're wondering why I wouldn't survive the next encounter if I actually won the Angel fight earlier with just Nanashi, yeah, that's why. Oh, and also he takes out Sudama with his next available turn, leaving me to fend for myself. However, before we can get vaporized, Flynn and Izabo come to our aid to help us take him down. Yeah, this fight is just a scripted fight that you can't really lose unless you get unlucky in the first turn. You may have noticed that this fight came right after the Angel fight with no pauses in between. 
get used to that because this game likes to sprinkle them in at the worst possible times. We head back to the Hunters Association where Flint tells Boss to make me and Asahi Hunters, to which he agrees, and then we come across this green ghost thing whose name is Navar. Hmm, Navar, 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 Navar. Where have I heard that name before? Oh, yes. Those were the days. I was father and mother's delight. <laughs> Navar, what's the matter? Get a hold of yourself. Oh, that's right. Yeah, pride to Mikado, my ass. He joins our party without our consent, but that's okay because we have access to a second partner, and he specializes in buffs and debuffs, which is something we don't have yet, and he can also use magic attack items. So I select him as our partner because I feel like Asahi is too unreliable right now because her demons have a chance to disobey her. Our next quest requires us to go to Ueno to meet up with Nozomi, who became the Fairy Queen in SMT4 because she needs our help with something. I recruit Jack the Ripper and Lanand Sheed. Lanand Sheed is going to be a godsend for the upcoming dungeons because not only does she have Dia and Medea, but she also has Heal Pleroma, which increases how much HP gets healed off. We meet up with Nozomi, who now has a squeaker voice for some reason, and she tells us that she needs help stopping a fight in the fairy forest, so we take the terminal to the forest and realize that Nozomi is actually Napaya, and we meet the real Nozomi and also Danu. Nozomi explains that one guy in the forest is hogging up the springs, and then she says her most iconic line. Special about this spring. No clue. Oh. God damn it, I skipped over it. Anyway, Nozomi joins our party and now we can get on to the fairy forest. I'm gonna highly recommend you set Nozomi as your partner because she's the only one who can output good damage, inflict ailments, and debuff enemies. Along the path we recruit the one and only Mothman, who makes the rest of the forest a complete joke, and that's thanks to his Shibabu skill which binds enemies, and he also learns Rakukaja, giving us our first demon with a buff skill. We bump into Oberon and Titania arguing over this green thing called a Jade Dagger which no one but Navar can hold so we just give it to him. The Jade Dagger is going to be an important part of this game because it gets rid of these Wraith Walls and the smaller Wraith Walls that give us treasure that we can trade for things like Bee Chains and Great Chakras. However, I don't really go for the smaller ones because I was rarely in a situation where I have the Dagger charge when I come across them so I don't ever trade anything to get items. We finally get to the end of the forest where the spring is, and it turns out that King Frost is the one hogging up the spring, and... Oh dear god, this guy sucks. Not only is he immune to all ailments, his ice moves also hit like a freight train. Specifically, King Bafula, which is medium ice damage to everyone, which really sucks considering that we don't have Medea yet, and no one in my party resists ice. And, to make this fight even more insufferable, he also has Smile Charge, which just allows him to smirk whatever the hell he feels like it, and paired with King Bafula is more than guaranteed to kill you. Suffice to say, our first attempt doesn't go well at all. After that, I go out to grind, my Mothman finally learns Rakukaja, so now we can buff up our defense and possibly survive King Bafula, so I go back to challenge him once again, and the fight ends the same goddamn way. He just destroys us with Smile Charge King Bafula, so after that I go to the shop in Ueno to buy the Blue Marine Body Armor, which gives you Ice Resistance, and I also buy 10 Augie Stones so that I can exploit his Fire Weakness. So I head back to the spring to challenge King Frost once again, and the fight goes more smoothly thanks to Nanashi's Ice Resistance, and because we can gain extra press turns thanks to the extra Augie Stones we bought. Admittedly, there was some luck that was involved, such as him hitting Porwit with King Bafula, but then hitting anyone but Porwin with Bafula, and I also had Magic Mirrors, which I completely forgot about, so... Yeah, I'm an idiot. Well, it doesn't really matter, as we were able to melt Frosty the Snow Giant back down to his normal size. After dealing with him, Danu decides that now is the perfect time to have a nice, wholesome mother-son conversation with Dogda about gods in the universe. Then we head back to the entrance of the forest, where Nozomi unfortunately leaves the party, and we head back to the Association to report a mission complete. Unfortunately, since we're beginner hunters, there really isn't a lot of jobs we can do, but this old man comes up to us and tells us that he has a job for us and to come to a separate room with him. Okay, this is already suspicious, like, bro, this is like telling kids that you have free candy in the back of your van. 
But despite all of the suspicious things surrounding this, we go with him anyway, and he reveals that he's actually Odin, who tells us that we can gain lots of strength in Kanda no Yashiro from a demon that's inside this thing called the Ark. Alright, now this is just sounding too good to be true, because seriously, we're the only ones who can break the seal? Like, it should be clear by now that there's some ulterior motive here. But we accept the quest anyway out of desperation. On my way to Kanda no Yashiro, I head to the shop to pick up the smart bazooka, which allows your gun attack to hit one to four times. Yeah, the multi-hit gun attacks are the reason why going for a dexterity build is a good alternative to a magic one. That, and you can also buy magic bullets, which are only affected by the dexterity stat and not the magic stat. We arrive at Kanda no Yashiro, where we have to climb inside this well to get to the Ark. Okay, if this doesn't scream extremely sus, then I don't know what does. I mean, you know it's sus when fucking Navarre is the only voice of reason. But because we're just two dumb 15 year old kids, we go into the shrine anyway. Upon walking further in, we come across a demon and an angel arguing over whose turn it is on the Xbox, and then Father Angel comes over to tell him to shut the hell up. The main goal of the dungeon is to obtain three crests in order to get to the Ark. In order to get them, we have to fight three mini-bosses. Up first, we have to fight Archangel and Principality. The thing about these guys is that they're not really hard, they're just spongy. All you need to know is that Principality is weak to gun and Archangel is weak to dark. Towards the end of the fight, both of them get lucky smirks from hitting Jack the Ripper with Hama and then insta-kill Mothman and Centaur. At this point, I was debating on resetting, but I saw that Archangel was in the red, so I just decided to fight them solo, and thankfully it works out in my favor, with them not being able to hit me too hard, and having a natural resistance to light. After defeating them, we grab the Malik Crest, which unlocks one of these three doors. For this one, it's the door all the way to the left. Beyond this point, I would be careful because you have a chance to run into this Oni Horde, who can very easily ruin your day with Critical Wave, which is low accuracy, but will crit almost every time it lands, and will do massive amounts of damage. But if you recruit in Mothman, literally just use Shibabu to bind them so that they either lose one turn or both of them. I cannot even begin to describe how absolutely necessary ailment skills are for random encounters, especially in the late game where you are going to be grinding against enemies that can very easily kick your shit in. I recruit an Ikunike, who is going to be very valuable for a while because he's the first demon of the run to have physical resistance. Then after going through this poison floor in the best way possible, it's time to fight the second mallet holder, Osijo. And oh boy does he suck dick. His basic attack hits two times and he can counter every time we hit him with a physical attack, which really sucks because Ikunike has Fangbreaker, which on top of being a physical attack, also lowers an enemy's attack power. And since the smart bazooka can hit one to four times, that also means he has a chance to counter how many times he gets hit with it, which is guaranteed to leave you close to death or just outright kill you. However, that's not even the worst he can do. The worst thing that he has that makes this fight so insufferable is Blight, which is a multi-target physical attack that has a chance to poison, and since this is SMT, your chances of getting poisoned are very likely. So, you might be thinking that I die due to all of what I just mentioned. That's partially true, but do you want to know how I actually die? Well, it's because I forgot he had Tetra card, and because I forgot he had it, I forgot that he threw it up in the first place, and I attack him with Itanike, which finishes him off, then Osei smirks and then kills Nanashi with Critical Wave. Another move I forgot he had. I go for my second attempt where he immediately poisons everyone with Blight except for Legion, which is very annoying, but I just decide not to cure it because he could just reapply it if he goes for Blight again. Instead of using gun attacks, I use whatever magic items I have so that I don't have to worry about Tetra card or counter. I wish I could explain a proper strategy for this fight, but... I really can't when one of his skills can inflict poison, and since it's early on in the game, we have no way to cure it, so really all this fight came down to was a lot of luck. When he gets to red, he kills everyone in my party except for me, forcing me to solo him. Thankfully, Ari Jesus is on my side, since Asahi was able to heal me, and Mose's critical wave misses, allowing me to deal the finishing blow to him. 
We obtain the mirror crest to unlock the second door forward, which is the door to the right. There's nothing really special about this part, it's just like the last one. I recruit an Apsaras who has Diorama, which is medium healing, and Pusumdi, which cures poison. So now we have two dedicated healers and a way to cure poison without dispoisons, which is perfect for the next upcoming boss... Oh, never mind. Well, we grab the horse crest and now we can open up the middle and final door. We jump down this waterfall which somehow doesn't kill us and come across the Ark. However, Sakuna Hikona really doesn't want us to unseal it, so we have to fight him. He really isn't a hard boss, but he can really screw you over if you fight him unprepared. He has Gram Slice, Makajam, and Rakunda, all of which can be easily dealt with. However, he has two other skills that can easily make this fight a pain in the ass. Infernal Hail, which is Mabafula and Sakuna in one skill, and Needle Storm, which is Mazama with a 60% chance to daze you, and what doesn't help is that Mothman is weak to wind, which sucks because he's my only demon with Rakukaja. My first attempt goes decently, but ultimately ends in failure. Before I go on, look at this fucking idiot using a summon stone on a demon that's alive. Anyway, I figure out that he has an electricity weakness, so I go to the shop in Ueno to buy the Earthus round, and then I go back to challenge him again, now that I'm able to output some good damage and get extra press turns. But just when I thought everything was going well, the game decides to dick me over and daze Nanashi and Apsara so that I can't heal, then just obliterate us both. So without much of a choice, I go out to grind, and during the grinding session I recruit a Kopitengu who not only resists wind, but also has Zanma and Tsukukaja, giving us our first demon with a medium magic attack and accuracy evasion buff. After a few more failed attempts, I began to see patterns in his movement. From what I've seen in every one of my attempts, he will always lead off with Infernal Hail, then the next turn he'll use Needle Storm. Once I figured out this pattern, I then realized what I had to do to ensure victory. The party I lead off with is Nanashi, Itunike, Apsaras, and Kopitengu. Even though Itunike has an ice weakness, what Sakuna Hikona can do to him after Infernal Hail isn't a big deal since he resists physical. If he does kill Itunike, then reset. The reason why we're leading off with Itunike is because he's the only one who can lower Sakuna Hikona's attack power, and there is no way he can cleanse that. So after his attack is fully debuffed, wait until he uses Needle Storm. After he uses it, bring Mothman out and buff up your defense. When it's his turn again, he should use Infernal Hail. After he uses it, swap Mothman out for Itunike, then just keep on rinse and repeating until you finally take your win. We're greeted by Odin, who congratulates us on our win, and for some reason starts getting pushy for us to break the seal of the Ark, to which Asahi finally realizes how sus this really is. But before we can back down, we are forced to unseal the demon inside the Ark, Krishna, who basically tells us that he is going to make Flynn his slave. Knowing that we fucked up big time, we head to Ginza to warn Flynn about Krishna and the Divine Powers, but unfortunately... Need to hang up that computer call. Come over here and kiss me on my hot mouth. I'm feeling romantical. Yeah, so basically Krishna talks about bringing salvation to the world and how their pods are yap and asks Flynn to join them. Flynn refuses and gets captured as a result. Then Krishna summons this giant serpent named Shesha that breaks a giant hole in the firmament, allowing the people of Tokyo to feel the sunlight. This is how you know that Krishna and his lackeys aren't playing around. They disappear into this purple portal thing, and now we have a third threat in Tokyo. The next day, we get an update on what areas Merkaba, Lucifer, and now the Divine Powers control, with the Divine Powers controlling Ginza and Tsukiji Konganji. We receive some supplies from Boss, and now we have to head to Shinjuku where we must deliver them. Upon arriving, we run into the goddess of Tokyo and Steven, who tells us that the fate of the future is in our hands. Before we can even understand what the hell that means, we receive word that Shesha just so happens to be where we are, specifically at the Metropolitan Government Office Plaza. I recruit Baizu Shen, who is going to be extremely helpful because she has Bafula and Medea, and later learns Makakaja and Mepatra. My Kopa Tengu evolves into Karasu Tengu, which gives him fire and light skills, as well as Pandemic Bomb. We head to the underground district, only to find it empty due to Shesha eating everyone. 
But that doesn't seem to be a problem for us since we're still able to deliver the supplies we were given. Finally, we arrive at the office plaza where we can now fight Sheisha. Who immediately takes down Baizu Shen with his seismic yawn. Yeah, this fight isn't really one you can win, it's more of a test of endurance. After a few turns, Power and Adramalik will join in on the fight, who at the beginning of every one of our turns will strike Sheisha for triple digit damage or close to triple digits. Then, after a few more turns, he'll heal himself and just piss right off. Well, since we technically repelled Sheisha from Shinjuku, we head back to Kinjicho to go to sleep, and then wake up for a morning conference where we finally meet Merkaba, who now has giant milkers for some reason, and Lucifer, who now looks cool. Lucifer gets right to the point and requests a ceasefire, to which Merkaba agrees so that everyone can focus on taking out the divine powers. We then receive two quests. We can either collect parts to build the Sheisha radar, or we can obtain the sword Amano Hamakiri from the Fairy Forest. It doesn't matter which one you choose, you still have to do both of them, so I opt to do the Amano Hamakiri quest first. I go to the shop to buy some new armor, then we head to the Fairy Forest that's in ruins thanks to the Divine Powers wanting Amano Habakiri for themselves, which is also known as Excalibur. Nozomi rejoins the party, and I'm going to once again recommend you set her as your partner. Actually, no, because she immediately leaves upon reaching the central gate, leaving us to wander beyond it ourselves. Going beyond the gate, you'll find the Scroll of Guiding, which will guide you through the maze to get to the sword. Now, when you read the scroll at first, it may not make a lot of sense, so allow me to simplify it down for you. If Nanashi's shadow is directly behind him, like you see here, just go forward into the next section. If it's to the right of him, like you see here also, go left, then repeat that for the last one. This is what the scroll means by thrice towards the light. The part where it says once toward your shadow should be obvious, just walk in whatever direction Nanashi's shadow is facing. And finally, the last part, once towards the light, is the exact same procedure as thrice towards the light. Hopefully that made some sense, and if it didn't, hopefully the video accompanying it should make it make sense. After going through the maze, we find the sword, but first we have to take down this titan. Titan isn't really a hard boss, but he is one of those bosses that can easily screw you over if he gets lucky. I bring Mothman out for this fight since he has a weakness to bind, which is perfect since we'll be able to not only farm more turns, but also make him lose turns. Unfortunately, towards the end, he kills my Baizu Shen and Mothman, but thankfully, I was able to deal enough damage to take him down. Dagda and Danu have yet another nice and wholesome mother son conversation about gods in the universe, and now we have to go to Kasumi Gaseki to complete the Shesha Radar quest with the Holy Sword Excalibur in our hands. We use this elevator to get down to Professor Matsuda's lab, where we hear two guys expositioning about the Ashurakai, then Matsuda walks in to tell us the exact same thing the quest description tells us. Everyone then receives information on where they're going to get parts, which for us is the Sky Tower, so we make our way over there, only to get told off by two angels. Thankfully, James Bond shows up to reason with them, and this is also where we meet Hallelujah. After a nice little chat with Hallelujah, Abe comes back, which means we can ascend the tower. There's nothing noteworthy to talk about, but we do get to the observation platform where we can see Tokyo from high up. But the observation doesn't last long as we get swarmed by a Rook. The Rook isn't hard at all. Just slap him around with fire and you'll be golden. During the fight, Hallelujah will join in with his demon Chiro, who can give us Endure for one turn, which will be very useful for a good while. After the fight, we are now able to set him as our partner, which for this part, I highly recommend you do, because on top of having Enduring Cheer, he also has Warding Shout, which will protect you from ailments. Which will be very handy, especially for a specific upcoming boss. We ascend further up the tower and reach the firmament, and find a room that just so happens to have the sensor for the device. But before we can escape with it back to Tokyo, Medusa comes back from the dead and wants a rematch. And oh boy, does she get it alright, because instead of using Warding Shout, Hallelujah insists on using Enduring Cheer, which ironically gets us killed, because we kept on getting inflicted with ailments, which is Charm and Bind, both of which incapacitate us. Thank you, Shin Megami Tensei. So before I grab the sensor and attempt the fight again, I go back to Shinjuku to buy the Silf Rounds, which is wind damage so that I can exploit Medusa's weakness, and hopefully finish the fight more quickly. When we do start the fight, Hallelujah now decides that using Warding Shout is a better idea, so now that we have good damage and good luck on our side, we are able to take down Medusa once and for all.
After avoiding getting turned to stone, we head back to Kinshicho to deliver the sensor and head to sleep, where we have yet another dream where we get called Akira for the third fucking time. In this dream, we're talking to Skins and what looks to be Mikado before Mikado, and then we have another flash where we see the Archangels. But before we can comprehend anything any further, we are rudely awakened by Asahi once again, who says we have to go to Ueno to meet the samurai dispatched by Merkaba. When we get to the Ueno Association, we meet their leader, Gaston the Magnificent Ass, who is also Navarre's younger brother. He then calls us Pewdie and demands we take him and a samurai to Kasumi Gasaki, so we do that, and then we head back down to Matsuda's lab to retrieve the Shisha radar that is tracked him in Shibuya, and Gaston, who totally didn't get ditched by a samurai, joins our party. I'm gonna recommend you don't set him as your partner just yet, because one of his most infamous mechanics is that he can interrupt your turn, which can either help you or screw you over, and the majority of the time, it's the latter. We head on over to Shibuya, where my Mo Rio evolves into Inferno, and... That's it. Once again, there's nothing noteworthy, so we just head straight to Shesha for round two. For round two, you're going to need to equip Amino Habakiri and set Gaston as your partner, because he has the Spear of Michael. Both weapons are the only ways to deal good damage, and are also Shesha's weakness. He has everything from his previous fight, which would be Seismic Yawn and Venomous Flare, which I forgot to mention, is fire damage with a poison chance. But now he has three more skills, Serpent's Hunger, Earthquake, and Lunge. All of which are physical attacks, and all of which, except for Lunge, can inflict ailments, and on top of all of that, he has Charge. My first attempt goes pretty well, actually, until he kills Baizu Shed with a Charged Earthquake, so I bring out Itinike in her place, but then immediately his next turn, he kills everyone except for Itinike and slowly and painfully whittles down his HP until he is dead. One thing I did notice towards the end of that attempt is that he was in his low health animation, so I'm almost certain I can do it without grinding, I just need to have some good luck on my side. So for my next attempt, I do just that and yeah, I do get lucky. But, however, this is a Shin Megami Tensei game, so it just had to make things look bleak. For one thing, I kept on getting inflicted with poison in bind, and Baizu Shen gets killed for a good measure. So I bring out Lin Sheeta in her place, which in my first attempt I should have done, but I didn't. So feel free to call me a moron in the comments. Another thing I notice is that despite hitting Sheisho's special physical weakness, we are doing a crazy amount of damage, but that's kind of my fault because I haven't been prioritizing the strength stat. Regardless, we managed to finish him off for the second time. Gaston is mega pissed that we slayed Shesha and not him, but we don't really give a shit as we head back to the association for another broadcast where we receive instructions to head to Sikiji Konganji because that's where the divine powers are holding Flynn. Isabeau joins us, and we head off to Sikiji Konganji, only for us to get a Jehovah's Witness preaching, so not wanting to join, we head down to Ginza, where I buy the Evil Bazooka, as well as Frost Rounds and Bind Rounds. I stumble into Tokyo Station, where we get into a fight with Black Frost. Unfortunately for him, he is not his Nocturne counterpart, so we defeat him with ease, thanks to his Light Weakness, and our reward is... Absolutely goddamn nothing, other than it completing a side quest. After that, we head back to where Flynn first got captured and talk to these Ring of Gaia members. They tell us that it has been split between the one Yuriko leads and the one that Maitreya of the Divine Powers leads. We're told to go to Harumi Way since it's a secret path to get into Sekiji Konganji, and it's also where we'll meet two women, Lady K and Lady Me. We head on forward to Harumi Way and go down into this poison passage and go through it in the best way possible, by swinging our sword like a freaking maniac. I recruit Shiwana and make it out of the Poison Passage, and we meet Lady K and Lady Mi, who tell us about the secret way into Tsukiji Konganji, and they ask us to bring this girl named Toki with us. So we head back to Tsukiji Konganji, where she shows us the secret way inside, so we head there and make our way upstairs. This part is kind of annoying, because there are Maitreya minions guarding the place, blocking off some paths. Finally, when we manage to get where we needed to go, we come across a dying Yuriko minion who tells us that Flynn is underground and gives us a key, so we head back downstairs and have to fight these two Maitreya cultists, who are complete and utter jokes, but spongy at the same time. Now it is on to the Lapis Lazui passage, where, as you probably guessed, nothing really happens, so we get to the end where we have to fight Jean Kui, 
who is another boss that really sucks, and that is all thanks to Javelin Rain, Berserker God, and Fame Breaker, all of which are physical attacks that can nuke you in an instant. And if you thought the bullshit ended there, he also has Imposing Stance, which straight up removes one of your press turns on your next turn. My first attempt ends with him killing Baizu Shen with Javelin Rain, and then killing Inferno and Kuramatengu with two severed Berserker Gods, then three turns later kills Nanashi with Javelin Rain. For my second attempt, I equip the Sylph Round since his weakness is Wayne, and I also bring out ETDK since he resists physical. However, he crits with Javelin Rain, kills Baizu Shed with Berserker God, kills Nanashi with Agilao, and then kills Kermit Tengu with another Berserker God, leaving ETDK to fend for himself. Thanks to his Fizz Resist, he does hold his own for a while, but inevitably follows suit with everyone else. For my third attempt, I bring out Shiwana as a throwaway demon because he has Fog Breath and Shang can't cleanse accuracy evasion debuffs. So after we use all of Shiwana's MP, I swap him out for Kerbit Tengu and just go all in with wind attacks and hope that we don't get hit with crits. Towards the end, he does get a lucky crit which scares me, but thankfully Nanashi was smirking and was able to take the Berserker God he followed up with, and finally, after many, many wind attacks, we finally take him down. We head into the next room where we see Flynn getting crucified like Jesus and Toki decides that now is the time to try and kill him, but Izabo stops her and now we must fight her. And she is not hard in the slightest. The only thing she has that is even remotely scary is Dark Sword, which inflicts mute, which <laughs> isn't even a threat at all if not she gets inflicted with it. Well, we finish the fight in no time and get surrounded by the Divine Powers, who send us into a scripted fight with Odin, and... Yeah, this is a fight you can't win. Krishna then exposes us as being nothing more than a reanimated corpse thanks to Dagda, and also for being the one to set him free. Uh... Whoops. The next day, we head to Cafe Florida, and... Yeah, everyone is mega pissed at us for what we did, but Skins of Fujiwara gives us a chance to redeem ourselves. We then receive our next quest, which is to just eliminate demons in the underground in Shinjuku, which we get done in no time. Then Isabeau comes along and tells us that demons are also raiding Kinshicho. So we head on over there, only to get into a fight with these Matreya cultists, who are complete and utter jokes but spongy just like the last ones. Asahi, realizing her father is in danger, runs ahead without us, and we chase after her and come across a bloodbath in the association. But before we can do anything else, we have to fight Ketsukoto, and... Oh. My. God. Is he the definition of insufferable? And that is thanks to his moveset. He has Zandite, Maragion, Makakaja, and worst of all, Blight. I am not exaggerating when I say this fight is insufferable, because normally this fight is a cakewalk. However, because of my limited healing options, and the fact that my options on demons are severely limited, the majority of them are either weak to what he can hit us with, or can't take any of his attacks because of their low HP and defense. After many failed attempts, I went out to grind, and I even have a folder literally called Ketsukoto Grinding, and I have other folders dedicated to grinding for the major bosses. This one is for a mini boss! So to make a long story short, I grind all the way up to level 53, recruit Ouroboros, and then buy the Green Among Us body armor since we'll be immune to poison and also resist wind and fire. It was then, at that moment, a thought crossed my mind. What if I do the fight solo? Now, it might sound crazy because, well, it is. But since I resist both elements he has, and now that I'm immune to the poison chance for Blight, I'll be able to hold my own since, uh, let's be honest here, my demons will just drag me down with them since the ones I would use are weak to wind or fire. So before I fight him, I remove all my demons from the active party, and I set Navar as my partner since he'll be the only way I can get any form of buffs. So with all of those preparations, I go in to challenge Ketsukoto once again. Be sure to have lots of Budo Stones of any kind because that is his weak point and make sure you have a decent amount of healing items on you as well. Because even though we have immunity to Blight's poison chance, we still don't have resistance to the attack itself and there is always the chance that he could crit and smirk as a result. The only time you should ever have to heal in this fight is when you're close to being in the red or in the red. So throw a Mudo Stone at him and then heal if you get to that point. 
if you keep up this rhythm, Katakoto should finally, finally go down after many hours of utter agony. Unfortunately, after the fight, boss dies and Krishna hijacks all the screens in Tokyo to tell us that he set up a domain that prevents anyone from summoning demons. However, thanks to Dogda's power, this doesn't apply to Nanashi. Skins of Fujiwara give us a call shortly after to give us details on our next mission, which is to destroy the domain. James Bond then comes in to give us a Miyoku disc, which we have to take to Tenkai in Midtown. So we head on over there to talk to him. He tells us that there are a total of five jars that power the domain, the Tokugawa Mandala, and we must seal them in order to destroy it. But he warns us that exposure to the ether, or magnetite as it's also known as, can ravage our minds. Everyone then tries to decide who is going to be the sacrifice for closing the jars, but Toki comes out of nowhere and volunteers his tribute. Oh, and as a nice little fuck you, Tenkai tells us that we have what we need to summon him, and by summon him, I mean fuse him. God damn it. Well, we leave Midtown in order to begin sealing the jars, but of course we have to fight bosses before we can, and for four of the five of them, we have to fight the four Devas. Up first is Bishamantan, who obliterates us on our first attempt, but we win on our second attempt by exploiting his fire weakness. After we defeat him, Toki begins to seal the jar and begins spouting some really sus shit that I am not going to discuss, so moving on. I head to Shibuya to buy the Volt Rounds and the Storm Rounds, then I head to the next shrine to face G. Kokuten, who also obliterates us on our first attempt, but we went on our second attempt by spamming his electricity weakness. Toki then goes to seal the jar while spouting some even more such shit. Then we move on to Kamokuten, who is weak to wind, and unlike the last two, we actually went on our first attempt. And you guessed it, Toki goes to seal it and starts spouting some even more such shit, but this time Gaston, like myself, gets tired of it and goes to try to seal it himself, but he fails miserably. But nonetheless, the jar gets sealed, and now we can move on to the fourth shrine where we have to face the last of the four devas, Zoshoten, who is weak to ice and, like Kamokuten, goes down on our first attempt. Toki seals the jar while saying some more sub shit because, of course, and now we can move on to the fifth and final shrine, where we have to fight Mari Shten, who is a complete joke of a boss, so moving on. Toki seals the jar and doesn't spout anything sus, and... Actually, she didn't even spout anything sus at all, and I'm saying this looking back simply because I wrote and recorded this without even looking at the footage. Whoops. Anyway, back to the game. So, Toki steals the last jar, lifting the domain. However, because of the amount of magnetite she inhaled, she passes out, and this ghost-like figure called Inanna appears above her, and... You guessed it, we have to fight her, and she obliterates us at the start of the frickin' fight. In all seriousness, this fight isn't hard, but can be a pain in the ass if you don't have the necessary resistances, because she has the weak versions of every single target magic attack except for Hama and Muda for some reason. I'm not gonna complain, but it's weird. And she also has the heavy multi-target versions of them. So after I get obliterated, I go out and grind and recruit Suiki, who blocks ice, and now that I have party members that can block at least one of her elements, I go back to fight her again, and it is much easier this time. She does resist everything except for physical and gun, but that's not a problem since so Nanashi can just blast her with his gun attack. Unfortunately, Baizu, Shen, and Lanad Sheed go down, but other than those setbacks, I'm able to beat her. Gaston deals the finishing blow to her before she can take over Toki's body, and now we are able to finally leave you son of a bitch! Yeah, for some reason, some jackass at Atlas thought that two consecutive bosses wasn't enough for this part, so they threw in Betraya so that there's three! Yes! Fucking three consecutive bosses. His weaknesses are gun and fire, but he has a skill called enlightenment that straight up absorbs his weaknesses in particular, which is one of the biggest fuck yous this game can throw at you. On my first attempt, I accidentally use gun when enlightenment is casted, so he absorbs it, causing him to smirk, and then he uses that opportunity to nuke us with 5.67 billion hands, which is almighty damage to everyone. <sighs> Before I go in for my second attempt, I go by flame rounds and I set Nozomi as my partner because she could debuff Matreya and also inflict him with ailments. Something that I didn't even know you could do, and it works out greatly because it makes it less likely that he'll cast Enlightenment, making it possible to tag on more damage. However, he hits Inferno with Bufu Dai, causing him to smirk and kills everyone except for Nanashi with Billion Hands. 
and instead of wasting my turns bringing out more demons, I decide to fight him solo since I have Nozomi to rely on for debuffs and ailments, and also Toki joins in on the fight and will attack Betraya at the end of our turn. Yeah, as you could probably tell, there was a lot of luck that was involved with this, and that is thanks to Nozomi being able to debuff Betraya's accuracy evasion, so we did get lucky dodging, so you just gotta keep up the rhythm, hit his weakness when Enlightenment isn't casted, and soon, this third consecutive son of a bitch can go down. We head back to Kinshicho and get a call from Skins of Fujiwara, who has now granted us access to the Hunter HQ in Kasumi Gasaki. Then we get to our room where Asahi is waiting for us, and we have a little chat with her. But Gaston is annoyed to the point where he's brutally roasting her, then Hallelujah punches him in the face and tells him to shut the hell up. And after that we just go to sleep like nothing happened. We wake up the next morning to find out that Sheisha is now in Ikebukuro, so we all regroup and head on over there for yet another rematch. Do be sure to set Gaston as your partner to quit Amano Habakiri if you haven't already, then approach him to start the fight. Sheisha has everything from his previous fight on top of two new skills. Well, technically three. Thousand Heads, which is a physical attack that is high crit, low accuracy to one target. Wave of Endless Power, Jesus Christ, how many mouthful names can they come up with? which is almighty damage to everyone, and Critical Eye, which replaces Charge, and what it does should be obvious. Now with all of that, you would think that this fight would take me multiple attempts. And you'd be wrong, because he has no way to cleanse any debuffs we place on him, or buffs we place on ourselves, so the fight just turns into a complete and utter joke. What's really funny is that he only used Critical Eye once the entire fight, but he immediately followed it up with Venomous Flare, which is a fire attack, so... Yeah, he goes down for the third and hopefully final time. Arias congratulates us on defeating Sheisha and gives us our next mission, which is to head to Sikichi Konganji, as Merkaba now thinks that the time to strike the Divine Powers is now, since Sheisha is defeated. I head down to the Ikebukuro shop to buy new armor, and I also buy the Laser Bazooka and Magnum Rounds. We get to Tsukiji Konganji where we run into Izabo and have her join our party as the angels and demons are now desperate to get to Flynn. When you get inside, I highly recommend setting her as your partner because she is the only one so far that has any form of magic attacks and she also has healing moves, making the upcoming dungeon very easy. However, it doesn't make it any less tedious since we have a teleporting door puzzle. Dear god, I can never escape these no matter what. We run into these three hunters who tell us that Matreya's Gaia minions allowed themselves to be Digital Devil Saga by Sheisha, and we finally get to the end of the dungeon where we see Flynn kill Odin, however he is wounded after the battle. Krishna then appears, prompting us to fight him, and... Yeah, it's Kenji all over again. As you just saw, his two signature moves, Venomous Raga and Dream Naraga, not only debuff either your attack or defense, but also have a 70% chance to inflict you with ailments, with Venomous inflicting you with poison, sick, or bind, and Dream inflicting you with every mind ailment. Then there is Moxagita, which is heavy almighty damage to anyone with an ailment infliction of any kind, which in this fight is very likely. If it felt like Kenji was kicking you in the balls with shoes in SMT4, Krishna comes out of nowhere and kisses you with steel toe boots. And to top it off, he has Combatar, which is literally luster candy, which buffs every stat once. After my first two attempts, I head back to the shop and I sell the Great Among Us armor for the yellow one because even though Krishna has both Zeodyne and Zandyne, he tends to use Zeodyne more often. Ironically, however, he kills me with Zandine in my next two attempts, so either he knows about my electricity resistance, or I'm just that unlucky. Left with no other options, I go out and grind up to level 65. Unfortunately, I feel like grinding didn't make much of a difference because... I have an entire folder dedicated to just this fight alone. And inside that folder, there are a total of five videos. You can guess how four of the five of them end. At this point, you might be thinking that I now have some sort of strategy, now that I have died enough times to see patterns, but... I don't. The best I can tell you is bring in any ailment resistance you can, and set Hallelujah as your partner since he can protect you from every ailment. 
Speaking on that topic, like with Medusa, he always insists on using Enduring Cheer instead of Warning Shout, which, again, is the reason why we die in the long run. So, yeah, all I can say is, hope that you're lucky with Warning Shout, buff up yourself and debuff him, and hit him with any dark attacks you have available to you. Oh, thank god it's over. Before we can celebrate defeating the Divine Powers and rescuing Flynn, we get sworn by angels who want to use him as their messiah. Thankfully, they are very easy. We also encounter this murmur, but again, very easy. We get to the exit and run into Lady K and Lady Me, who order Toki to kill Flynn, but she refuses and now we have to fight the minions they throw at us. Like their Maitreya cultist counterparts, they are very easy. Unlike their Maitreya cultist counterparts, they are not spongy, so this fight is done in a matter of seconds. We make it outside and are immediately accosted by Adramalek, who wants to take Flynn to Lucifer, but we're not going to hand him over without a fight. And he annihilates us with Hellish Brand Madness Needles. For my next attempt, I assign Izabo as my partner instead of Toki, and I also swap up Bison Shed for Inferno, since he can block Hellish Brand. And from there, the fight is a cakewalk. Spam him with any ice moves you have available to you until he's dead. We head back to Kichi Show to go to sleep and wake up the next morning to Toki staring at us. Then we head to the Association, where everyone is talking about Flint's rescue and the Divine Power's defeat. Gaston receives word that the Crusaders have now been dissolved, meaning he is no longer captain, and he also has to return to Mikado. Moments later, we get a quest that requires us to infiltrate Mikado. Well, that's convenient. Before we can do that, we head to Kasumi Gasaki and come across a weapons shop that Napaya is running. This shop in particular is where you can get some really good shit, and we will most definitely be back here for more. I do decide to buy the white stealth armor since it gives me a dark resistance, something that I am definitely going to need for later. On the same floor is where we meet with skins of Fujiwara, who tells us that we need to infiltrate Mikado to gather intel with Izabo. Dr. Matsuda gives us our fake IDs, and then we go put on some disguises. Yeah, they will totally think we're citizens of Mikado. We take the terminal to the Sky Tower and get to the Hall of Grief, where our power is checking everyone's gauntlets, and to our surprise, we make it through. But this angel decides to give Asahi some words. You are wearing makeup. Makeup is a corruption invented by fallen angels. You also look... dreadful. Like a tarted up clown. He's back on it. Hurry along, you're holding up the line. <laughs> Tarted up clown? <laughs> I can't believe you got fashion advice from an angel. <laughs> Ow! Stupid angel. Damn, she cannot catch a break. <laughs> well, we make it to the exit of the firmament and make it outside Mikado. Everyone takes the time to admire the fresh air, the sky, and the sun. But Navar... Here again. So many bad memories flooding my mind. Oh, how I long to return to Tokyo. We get told that we're too early for a meeting that's supposedly going to take place, so we decide to wander around Mikado for a bit. I head to see the apothecary to buy some magic stones, since they are going to be essential for the upcoming bosses. Then we head to the monastery, where we notice that there's a freaking car. What the hell? And also, Hallelujah notices a gauntlet, and we turn it on, then get kicked out. After going around the casualty in the Luxurious District, we head back to the plaza where the meeting begins. We see Jonathan, who turns into Merkaba, tell everyone that tomorrow begins Armageddon against Lucifer in Tokyo. Then we get spotted and get thrown into the Slammer. Before we wake up in the Slammer, we have yet another dream where we are this guy named Akira. You know what, at this point, I don't really give a shit, so we wake up in the Slammer and get a visit from Gaston, who tells us that our equipment is in the monastery, and that we can still use our demons despite not having a phone. Wow, the privileges of being an SMT protagonist. Thanks to that, we are easily able to bust out, but it isn't long before we get caught, meaning we have to fight this angel horde. This is the reason why I suggested buying the Magic Stones, specifically any of the Mudo, Zan, and Bufu Stones, since they are weak to all three elements, and I also have Ice Ammo for good measure. The first horde goes down without any issues, and that is thanks to Suiki getting Mazandine from a lucky skill mutation. When the second horde comes in, that's when we start having problems. 
They hit Kermitangu with Grand Attack, which is a gun attack, which he is weak to, causing them to smirk, then they cast Mahamon, killing everyone except for Nanashi, who naturally blocks it. We do manage to barely win the fight solo, but we do. Now you might be thinking that we're gonna be able to, oh, I don't know, heal up before we go to the monastery. <laughs> uh, yeah, hell no. The game has us go to the monastery and fight Azrael right after we take out the Angel Hordes. Remember when I said that this game likes to sprinkle in consecutive boss fights and no time to recover? So back to Azrael, he fucking annihilates us by using Blink of Death, which is a heavy dark attack, which I resist. Then he follows it up with Agidine to finish me off, which means I have to fight the two Angel Hordes again, and I die in those fights, so you know what that means, it's time to grind. And by grind, I may go from level 67 to 68 and recruit Morle, who has Mabufudine, giving us more ice coverage for Azrael. So with all that, we go back to fight the Angel Horde, and just like the first time, the first Horde goes down with no issues. The second Horde, we get issues, but less, and what I mean by that is, rather than fishing solo, I finish with Nanashi and Lorelei alive. After that, we head back to the Monastery to show Azriel a rematch. I bring out Inferno for this fight since he knows fire and has Rakukaja. Lorelei, however, is literally the only thing that makes this fight go from hard to a complete joke because she has Makara card, which repels Azriel's magic attacks back at him, and since those are the only attacks he has outside of a basic normal attack, he literally cannot touch us at all, so he finished the fight in no time. Well, the first part anyway. He calls forth reinforcements to surround us, meaning we can't do jack shit, but Hallelujah out of nowhere goes Super Saiyan and annihilates them all, leaving Azriel left. Just like the first part, hit him with ice moves, throw him a Karakarn, and watch him fail to do anything to you. After the fight, we find our equipment and we take the gauntlet we found with us and head straight to the terminal to escape. Unfortunately, our phones are blacklisted, meaning we can't use it and get ambushed by a throne. Fortunately, Gaston kills him and uses his gauntlet to take us to Kasumi Gasaki. We give our report to Skins of Fujiwara and head back to Kinshi Cho to go to sleep. The next morning, Merkaba and Lucifer announce that the ceasefire is now over and call upon anyone to side with either of them. Haulia gets a message from Abe informing him that the Ashurakai is siding with Lucifer. Fortunately, he decides to stay with us. After we leave the association, we run into Steven in the Goddess of Tokyo, who explained to us that she lost her power because of the people being divided. They disappear, and now we head for Camp Ichigaya to take out Merkaba and Lucifer. When you get to the large map, the theme that's currently playing really sets the tone perfectly. It really gives you the feeling that you are in the final stretch of the game. Anyway, when we get to Camp Ichigaya, we run into Izabo, who got released from Mikado since it's in crisis right now, and joins our party. We head inside to Camp Ichigaya and immediately come across a wall we can't pass through. I'm gonna warn you right now, get ready for a long ass dungeon. In SMT4, this dungeon wasn't long at all, but in this game, it is, and you'll see why. When we get to 4B3, we have to fight these four Barbatos, who fuck me up big time, and the only way I win the fight is thanks to the assist gauge being maxed out at the perfect time. What these guys were guarding was a portal to... Oh god damn it! Yep, it's time to go through the Hall of Eternity once again, this time being divided into two sections on two completely different sides of the dungeon. This time around, it has Wraith Walls that are not in the same area as the station that powers up the Jade Dagger. So what you have to do is enter a door that gives you access to the station, then you have to go through a door that puts you in front of the walls and not behind them. While wanting to bash my head through a wall, I recruit Fenrir, who is going to be a godsend since he has Neho Claws and Critical Eye. No questions as to why. Shortly after that, I just give up trying to figure out the puzzle, and... I just figure that since I'm nearing the endgame, I may as well just grind a bunch of levels since... I know for a fact that Merkaba and Lucifer are gonna be hard as shit. I also recruit Kudlak and Pendragon. Pendragon is going to be yet another godsend because he has Acid Breath, which decreases an enemy's defense and agility, and he also has Titan Omakia and Charge. So I grind all the way up to level 74 and go back to the Hall of Eternity once again. Really, the only thing I can tell you is trial and error are your only ways to proceed. 
the only way you can tell that you're at the correct door to fight the bosses is if the door shows an attention symbol. If you come across it, make sure you're prepared and go inside to fight Lucifuge. And just like his SMT4 counterpart, he is a complete and utter joke, though I do get unlucky at my first attempt, but he does go down in my second attempt. We go through the portal that spawned on the first floor, which takes us back to Camp Ichigaya, so we head over to the other side of the camp to get to the other part of the hall. Like last time, we have to fight a boss before we can go through the portal, this time being a Fallen Horde. And they are significantly easier than the four Barbatos, so we take them down easier. But that's not all, oh no. Immediately after we deal with them, we have to fight this demon army, who proceed to annihilate us. For my second attempt, like the first time around, the first horde goes down without any issues. When the second horde comes in, I swap Shiwana out for Jack the Ripper since he has Hamon, another skill I got through a lucky mutation. So with that, the demon army doesn't last much longer. We hop inside the portal to the next part of the hall and come across hunters who are unconscious, so we take them back to the entrance of the camp before we go any further. Before we do head back in, I go back to Nampaya's shop to buy the white stealth leggings and the Genbu Bob, which are ice bullets with 117 attack power. After we get all of that, we head back to the Hall of Eternity. For this part of it, there are no wraith walls, thankfully, but the same advice I gave earlier still applies. Just trial and error your way through until you find a door with a attention symbol. Once you do, be sure to equip the Genbu Bob and head inside to fight Belial. And like Lucifuge, he's a big joke. What's really funny is that his gimmick from SMT4 where if he use a buff or a debuff he'll use Silent Prayer, that shit is just gone now, so yeah, we just win the fight, no problem. We take the portal back to Camp Ichigaya and now the wall that was blocking our path is now gone. We head further down and bump into yet another roadblock, that being another portal that takes us to the Hall of Eternal Light. Upon entering, we hear Abe's voice who tells Hallelujah that he has some truth to share with him and to come meet him. As far as Eternal Light is concerned, it is mostly exactly the same as it was in SMT4, but there are Wraith Walls now, but thankfully they are not as tedious to get around. I recruit Cerberus and get to the end of the hall, and Abi reveals that he is actually the Demon Samyaza, then he just pulls a... Uh... No. I am your father. Yeah, so as you may have guessed, we have to fight him, and... Yeah. Moving on. A portal spawns in front of us, which leads back to the camp, and we see that the blockade is no longer there, allowing us to finally get to the bottom of Camp Ichigaya, where the Yamato Perpetual Reactor is. Before I head inside, I turn my ass around and head to a shop to stock up on Moodude and Hamon Stones, then I head inside to where Merkaba, Lucifer, and Flint's forces are standing off. Merkaba turns to us and asks us to join him, but obviously we turn him down because... Would you really want to side with the guy who was hell-bent on executing you earlier? Well, he isn't one to take a rejection lightly and orders Gaston to kill us, but Gaston tells him to fuck off and breaks his spear. And now we can finally take on Merkaba. <laughs> or maybe not. If it wasn't already obvious, Merkaba is a bitch. He has everything from his previous fight in SMT4, and that includes his second phase skill, since in this game he only has one. All of these, as you would probably expect, hit you hard, especially Thunder Rain, Deadly Wind, and Riot Gun, since the majority of the demons I'm constantly relying on are weak to one of the three attacks. And what doesn't help is our ways of healing outside of Izabo and Asahi are limited and unreliable, since items are obviously limited, and my healing demons are unable to outheal his damage since they only have Medea. Oh, and his other three skills? Yeah, they're the cherry on top. Finally, I give up and go out to grind for nearly four fucking hours, all the way up to level 82. And during that time, my Cerberus learns Warcry, which debuffs an enemy's attack and defense. So with that, I go back to challenge Merkaba once again, and... Oh man, the difference Warcry makes is night and day. Sure, I do have Acid Breath, which debuffs defense and agility. However, agility buffs and debuffs do not make much of a difference in this game like they do in Nocturne and Digital Devil Saga. The team I settle for is Cerberus, Ouroboros, and Fenrir. Cerberus because he has Warcry, obviously. Ouroboros because she has Makakaja, and Fenrir because I can get extra turns and good damage with Critical Eye and Nihil Claws. The fight, for the most part, goes pretty well. 
every second HP threshold, he starts using Hexagram and Shall Not Resist. The other two skills that I mentioned are the cherry on top of his already scary moveset. In fact, after the dialogue, he immediately goes for Hexagram and kills Fenrir, so I bring out Suiki in his place, and I also swap out Cerberus for Pendragon since he was nearly out of MP. After yet another damage threshold, Flint sends the Hunters to attack Merkaba. I would highly recommend using this opportunity to heal up if you need to, otherwise you can either just tell them to not attack Merkaba or you can join them. Once we get back to the fight, it isn't long until Merkaba is finally, finally down. Now that Merkaba is down, we can finally take on the last threat Tokyo faces, Lucifer. Now, I'm pretty sure this fight will be easy. Thank you, Shin Megami Tensei. <laughs> no, he is just as hard as Merkaba, and that is thanks to his bullshit moveset. He has Evil Gleam, which if you forgot, inflicts panic, so assigning Hallelujah as your partner is absolutely necessary, because on top of Warning Shout, you are going to need everything he has, and yes, that includes Enduring Cheer, something I thought I'd never say, since Lucifer has the option to just blow you up with Hades Blast, freeze you with Glacial Blast, or blow your guts out with Myriad Arrows. He also has Morning Star, which just divides your current HP in half, which can really dick you over if he uses it at the beginning of one of his turns. I tried this fight three times by reloading save states. On the third attempt, I kept Izabo as my partner, and you can guess how that ended. So, get ready for this. I go out to grind once again, this time all the way up to level 89, and I make sure to get my magic stat up to 200, so that I can just wail on him with any blight stones I have available, since setting Hallelujah as my partner makes my healing options go from reliable to unreliable. So with all the levels, we go back to challenge Lucifer to a rematch, but first we have to take down Merkaba because someone at Atlas thought that this game didn't have enough consecutive fights. Thankfully, with the 7 additional levels, we absolutely wipe the floor with him. Now we can take on Lucifer- Oh my god, it's like all that grinding didn't freaking matter. Well, there is not much I can really say other than use any light attacks you have available to you and pray to god that you're lucky. If you can, make sure that the assist gauge is either full when you defeat Merkaba or close to full, that way you can at least have a chance to recover or wail on him without any concern of getting wiped out. I swap out Fenrir for Itanike because not only can he lower Lucifer's attack with Fangbreaker, but he can also lower his agility. Now, I know I said earlier that agility buffs and debuffs don't make much of a difference, but in this fight, you just have to pray that they do. Towards the end of the fight, he takes out Ouroboros and returns ETDK to my stock with Kingly One, a skill I forgot to mention and forgot about, so I break out Jack the Ripper because he has Hamon, but I saved him in case I absolutely needed him because... He is only level 57 and I didn't want my only demon with Hamon to be taken out early on. Unfortunately, Lucifer does take him out with Myriad Arrows and almost kills Suiki with Hades Blast, but he survives thanks to Enduring Cheer. The one time I think this skill has actually been useful. A turn later, however, he takes him out with Morning Star, forcing me to solo him, which gives me a couple of close calls, such as Glacial Blast almost killing me, which would have sucked because the assist gauge was full. But thankfully, it only hits me one time, leaving me barely alive. My partners attack him, and with one final Hamon Stone, Lucifer finally, finally goes down. <sighs> you guys have no idea how happy I am that this part of the game is finally over. When everything is all said and done, some are celebrating and some are in disbelief. But alas, every threat in Tokyo is now gone. We go to sleep and wake up to head to a party in Kasumi Gasaki to celebrate our victory. Well, there you have it. It is possible to beat Shin Megami Tensei 4 Apocalypse without deleting demons and without Demon Wisp. Oh, what the hell is going on? Everyone just all of a sudden becomes incapacitated, and we learn that Flynn is actually Sheisha, making him a backroom skin stealer. He reveals that everything since Tsukiji Konganji was staged so that we could take out Merkaba and Lucifer for them, 
so that they can enact their plan without them interfering. He then tries the Digital Devil Saga us, but Asahi takes the hit for us, leaving nothing but blood in her goggles, and then Seisha turns into a giant freaking egg called the Cosmic Egg. Krishna and Odin appear and show that the real Flynn is still crucified and just disappear. Fujiwara gives us a call to come down to the base, so I head down there and quickly buy the bull bazooka and log rounds, then head to the command room where our objectives are to rescue Flynn, defeat Krishna, and destroy the Cosmic Egg. We're told that we are the only ones that could do this because all the hunters are... Great vegetables. Thank you, Dojima. Before leaving, we are given the gauntlet we stole for the monastery, which turns out to be Akira's gauntlet, and we also find out that we are his reincarnation. Yeah, you know, the guy we've had consecutive dreams about from his perspective? Turns out that was just us from a previous life. After we get our plan figured out, we head outside and are immediately ambushed by members of the Divine Powers, who go down with no issues. Another horde comes in, but the Ashurakai show up and deal with them, and we also get a call from Lady K and Lady Mi. As it turns out, everyone from all these other factions in Tokyo and Mikado are uniting to help out. So with that ease of mind, we head on over to the Cosmic Egg, where we now have to fight Odin. Odin can either be a big pain in the ass or somewhat easy. In the two attempts it took me to beat him, I got something in between. The reason I say that is because of his will and thunder skill, which grants him the ability to pierce through any electricity resistance we have. This, coupled with Thunder Rain, is guaranteed to leave you close to death, or if he couples it with Concentrate, it is more than likely to just outright kill you. Suffice to say, bringing electricity resistance into this fight can be made obsolete if he goes for Will of Thunder too often. I hope you bought the long rounds from Napaya's shop because these were the only thing that made this fight even possible. So keep your defense up and his attack down when you can, and Odin should get blown away in no time. Gaston picks up Odin's spear, giving him access to not only some of the best physical skills in the game, but ones that pierce. We take this green pillar out of the ground and can now enter the Cosmic Egg. Immediately when we enter, we are accosted by Krishna, and Toki turns into a Nana, and oh, I am not going into further details. So, long story short, Toki gets possessed, Betraya becomes Mitra Buddha, and casts a barrier that prevents Doctor from reviving us if we die. So, be careful, and save as often as possible, because if you die and made a lot of progress, you are going to hate yourself and this game. The Cosmic Egg is the second largest dungeon in the game, so as you should expect, there are a lot of bosses. Up first is Bale, and... I swear to god, no matter what my level is, I always get dicked by a boss. Rather than getting my ass handed to me again, I go out to grind and recruit Yaksha, who has McGown, which removes Smirk, Tetra Card, Makajamaon, and most importantly, Mipatra. Mipatra is the biggest saving grace here, since Bale's Vengeful Thunder has a 60% Bind chance, and his Mist Rush has a 70% Daze chance, but Tetra Card makes that completely irrelevant. I leave the Egg to go back to the Pious Shop to buy the Blue Agent Armor so that I can block Vengeful Thunder and Maziodyne, then I head back inside for a rematch, which goes pretty well up until he brings out moves I brushed off like Agidine and Maggie Dolan. At the end of the first rematch, he kills everyone except for me, so I try to solo him, but unfortunately he dazes me and takes me out, and this exact thing would happen, not once, not twice, but three times! If you thought that this fight wasn't already a big enough bullshit pile, allow me to add one more piece of bullshit to the pile. If you deal ice damage with your gun attack, it will still trigger retaliate. Yes, I'm being serious, and how many times it triggers is dependent on how many times the attack hits him. So if you hit him four times, he has a chance to retaliate that many times. If you have Tetra Card up, then retaliate isn't that big of an issue because even though it does hit you with a physical attack, it doesn't get rid of it. But aside from that, this fight is the biggest test of luck and because of that, I win in the stupidest way possible. So, you know how I mentioned that Mist Rush has a 70% chance to daze? Well, if you repel it back at Bale, there is a chance that he could be dazed, which is something I didn't know, and when that happens, it lasts for a good while. When it wears off, however, he kills everyone except for me, 
Which would be a bad thing if it wasn't for the fact that he did it when he was close to death, and Hawaii finishes him off with a magic compressed true Bufu Dine. We take out this purple pillar and proceed to the next area where the boss is Apsu, who is not challenging in the slightest, so moving on. We take out the blue pillar and move on to the next area where I recruit the last demon of the run, Sphinx, who has Mediorama, Mahomon, Grantak, and most importantly, Mediorahan, giving us our first demon in a while who has reliable healing as well as some of the best attacks. The boss of this area is Seth, who is yet another joke and goes down in no time, allowing us to take another pillar and move on. Heading further in, we run into the first major boss of the dungeon, Inanna. Inanna's second fight is honestly one of my favorites in this game, and that's because she is able to change her affinities like she could in her last fight. To refresh your memory, if she casts a fire attack, she'll be weak to ice, and if she casts a wind attack, she'll be weak to electricity and vice versa. Whatever elemental ammo type you bring into this fight ultimately doesn't matter since whatever she's weak to is always changing. If she is weak to whatever you bring in, capitalize on it as much as you can. One unfortunate thing about this fight is that all her magic attacks are severe damage, which with our current HP, is enough to insta-kill anyone in my party. This is why I'm glad I have Sphinx, because I no longer have to rely on Izabo for healing, making me comfortable enough to bring Hallelujah into this fight, because on top of being able to deal a shit ton of damage when Inanna is weak to ice or fire, he is able to prevent my demons from getting one shot thanks to Enduring Cheer. Congratulations Hallelujah, your Enduring Cheer is actually keeping me alive, rather than being the thing that gets me killed in the long run. With all this under my belt and being able to keep up the pressure, and Nana goes down and separates from Toki, allowing Danu to absorb her power. Before we move on, does anyone have any bleed? We take the pillar and move on to the next area where we have to actively find another pillar through a maze I don't feel like explaining, so I find that one and we run into Mitra Buddha, who tells us that we're the reincarnation of King Aquila, whose real name was Akira, and Flynn is the reincarnation of the guy who committed seppuku in our dreams. Funny that our dreams are 100% accurate to reality. Because our souls are immortal according to him, he wants to kill us so that they can enact their plan. Mitra Buddha is another one of my favorite fights and can be frustrating if you don't know what you're doing. He has a weakness to fire and force, but if you do take advantage of those, Self-Righteous Vow will activate, which is a passive skill that gives him a free luster candy. The best way to deal good damage to him is to either bring in gun or electricity since those are the only things he doesn't know or resist. You might be asking, well can't you just use Dikasha? Yeah I can, up until the latter half of the fight where he begins to cast Illogical Rejection, which straight up negates the effects of Dikasha in Silent Prayer, which isn't a problem if he is debuffed and his only ways to buff himself are locked behind us in his weakness and attack buffs he gets after a certain HP threshold has been hit. As for the rest of his skill set, it can potentially kill you if you get unlucky. The worst he can do to you is Critical Eye Hades Blaster Berserker God, which is more than likely going to make him smirk, and he always follows it up with Severe Judgment, which is an almighty attack that has its damage increase with smirk. He also has Tetra Break to get rid of our physical shield, which is actually a more than viable strategy I use, so that he only gets two press turn icons, which increases our chances of not getting nuked. Isabo is the best partner for this fight, even though I have Sphinx, but I was saving him for if Isabo gets taken out at all because he has a weakness to ice, which Mitra can hit him with, and she also has Luster Candy. This fight took me three attempts, and one misclick will cost you greatly. Thankfully, that doesn't happen, and we finish him off. Before going any further, I leave the egg and buy Hamon stones for a certain upcoming boss. When we get back, we finally get to the end of the dungeon where Donda asks us whether we'll make his universe or stick with the old one. Since the majority of my decisions I made were ones my friends agreed with, it doesn't matter whether I side with him or not, but I tell him to shove his universe up his ass, which angers him, prompting him to stop supplying us with his power, which is slowly killing us. The first part of the fight is an endurance test, so don't use any of the Hamon stones that you may have bought. Yeah, that certain boss I was talking about, this is the one. After a few turns have passed, Danu burrs another Dogda. That is something I thought I'd never say. Who gives us his power so we can fight his older version? Unlike the last two bosses, he has no gimmick, which gives us a nice break before the real final boss of this dungeon. 
He does have Denial, which is his version of Kingly One, and Lost Hit, which guarantees a demon to get lost. But if you have Hallelujah, you can cancel it out entirely. Keep spamming any light moves you have readily available until he's dead. Brought down by my own God Slayer. You've become quite strong, kid. It's fine. Thought things might shake out this way after all. Unlike humans, the path of gods is set in stone. Start to finish, those of us who represent human understanding cannot waver from the roles we're assigned. But that's not how I would choose to exist. So, you're not going to kill me. Damn, those last words are kinda depressing. Nanashi obtains the only skill that he's allowed to have access to, that being Awakened Power, which gives us the ability to pierce through any resistance. Even though this is a skill, it's still allowed because, hey, I didn't learn through Demon Whisper, and this is one you actually can't say no to because immediately after defeating Dogda, or your friends in the Massacre route, you're forced to learn it, and the only way to get rid of it is to override it with another skill, which I can't do. Dogda removes Mitra's barrier, so we no longer have to worry about dying, and he also revives all the souls of the Cosmic Egg, including Asahi, who also obtains Awakened Power, and for her, it increases how much HP she heals outside of full heal spells. Yeah, speaking of that, everyone except for Navarre and Izabo gets Awakened Power, and Asahi is the last one to get it, but I forgot to mention it for everyone else, so... Here's a list of what everyone gets with their awakened power. After Asahi rejoins the party, we head into the next room where we finally get to Krishna and Flynn. Following some dialogue about salvation, Krishna uncrucifies Flynn and they fuse together, making Vishnu Flynn, who we now have to fight, and he annihilates his knight in five turns in. Oh my god. Allow me to tell you why that is. He has a similar gimmick to Yanana, where a skill he uses makes him weak to that skill's opposite element, but it's only limited to two of his skills, Light Nandaka and Dark Nandaka. You can guess what element both of those skills are. On top of that, he has Thought, which is severe almighty damage with a debilitate effect, and Shine No More, which is heavy almighty damage that can hit one to three times with a daze chance. Oh, and he also has Riot Gun, Zeodyne, Zandine, Dakaja, and Dakunda for good measure. I tried this fight four times. Before the latter three attempts, I completed some side quests and even bought the Garment of Hope, which is one of the best armors in the game, that gives you resistance to everything except for physical, gun, dark, and obviously almighty, and that didn't even make a difference. Left with no other options, I came into the inevitable that I have to grind, even though I'm MX level, so how would I do that? Well, SMT4 Apocalypse has a DLC that unlocks the level cap so that we can exceed level 99. However, there are two drawbacks to this. For one thing, you no longer earn app points, but that isn't the issue. The other drawback is instead of earning 5 stat points like you normally do, you only earn 2, which is kinda bullshit considering that leveling up already takes a very long time. But what if there was a way to make it so that it doesn't take a long time? Remember at the beginning of the video when I said that I'd be allowing the use of the grinding DLC? Yep, now is the perfect time to start using it, so I go to the challenge quest, select a God Slayer Needs levels, and start grinding. The enemies here are obviously very weak and provide little to no experience at all, but we're not fighting them for the EXP. We're fighting them because they drop the Grimoires, which allow you to level up. The Light Ones only give you a certain amount of EXP. How much you get is dependent on your current level. And the Heavy Ones just give you all the EXP you need to get to the next level. There's also the Fred Grimoire, which is just a heavy grimoire, but it only works for your partners. The best enemies to seek out are Army Tamas, because they drop all three grimoire types, but there's no way of knowing you'll encounter it except for these tiny floating pixel demons, and even if you do come across them, there's a chance it can be the other Mitama types. I do all of this for over an hour, which gets Nanashi and my partners into the level 100s, as well as getting my most useful demons into the level 80s. 
with all of that, I head back to the main game and go challenge Vishnu Flynn once again. I bring Navar into this fight because of one thing. Doping. Doping is a skill that increases your max HP by 30%, which for some of my demons in Nanashi, exceeds our HP into the thousand range. This alone is a game changer, because it means that we can possibly tank in Tykthon followed by Shine more. The other reason I brought Navar out was so that I can get buffs without wasting a turn, since I need every one of those turns to debuff Vlishnu or to attack him, and he also has Debilitate. Midway through the battle, Flynn tries to fight over Krishna's control, but fails, and now he's pissed and busts out two additional arms and four lightsabers. This phase is actually when he starts using the Nadaka skills, meaning we can finally take advantage of a weakness. Make sure you bring in someone who isn't weak to light or dark. It doesn't matter whether they're immune to it or not, since both of them pierce through any form of resistance. The two demons I bring into this fight that are absolutely necessary are Sphinx for healing and light damage, and Fenrir for getting more turns with Critical Eye and Heal Claws. The third slot I leave open-ended for if I need to swap out a demon for any reason. Towards the end of the fight, Flynn begins to fight back against Krishna's control even more, to the point where there's a chance he could lose one press turn. But it's also where my Sphinx gets blown away with Zandine, Nanashi gets killed with Dark Nandaka, and Fenrir miraculously survives it, and it just so happens that the assist gauge was full, so after that goes off, Vlishnu gets finished off. That's more than I can take. Krishna and Flynn separate from each other, and Navar calls out to Izabo to give Flynn Masakado's katana. Upon doing so, Flynn wakes up and finishes off Krishna for real this time, allowing us to finally bleed the cosmic egg dry of all of its remaining power. Well, there you have it. It is possible to beat Shin Megami Tensei 4 Apocalypse without Demon Whisper and without deleting demons. Oh hey, this forest looks familiar. Okay, okay, if it isn't already obvious by how much time is still left in the video, we're not done here. Steven comes to us in our dreams and basically says we can either live in fear of God or just take him out, like that's the most normal thing a person can say. When we wake up the next morning, we find out that everyone else had the same dream we did, so we head to Ginza where we give Steven the pillars we got for the cosmic egg, and he makes the monolith that takes us to the final dungeon of the game. Yoi's Universe. Flynn joins us as a guest character, and he can do two things. When you're walking around the dungeon, he can get into a fight with any encounters that are on the field, and he'll give you any items you may have picked up from them if you talk to him. When you get into an encounter, you may notice this Flynn icon right here. This allows you to use this new skill called Messiah Blast, a severe almighty attack to all enemies, but it can only be used when Nanashi is smirking, and if Flynn isn't already in another encounter separate from you. As for the dungeon itself, <laughs> if you thought you'd be able to get this done in a reasonable amount of time, oh, think again. This dungeon consists of teleporting boxes, teleporting corridors, one-way corridors, wraith walls, and strong enemies for good measure. When we get to a certain point in First Braid G, we see a silhouette of Walter who claims there's something he must do, then disappears. Finally, after an hour and a half of exploring the dungeon like an idiot, we get to the first bosses, Beelzebub and Lucifuge. Beelzebub has Debilitate, Maziodyne, Grand Tech, and Megidolon, and Lucifuge has everything he had from his previous fight. Let me just say, fighting these guys together is an absolute pain in the ass, because if one of them uses a heavy hitting attack, the other is more than likely to leave you barely alive or just outright kill you. You're going to want to bring in any form of light attacks and electricity attacks since Lucifuge is weak to light and Beelzebub is weak to electricity. Who you take out first doesn't really matter since taking out one of them will cripple the other and it won't be long before the other one soon follows. And if you thought that was all, oh how wrong you would be. Now we have to fight Lucifer again, who comes out of nowhere with his bullshit moveset and annihilates us, meaning we have to do the Beelzebub and Lucifuge fight all over again. I bring Asahi in for the second attempt, but that doesn't make much of a difference since my demons just get picked off one by one. 
Then I remember something. I have Yaksha, who not only innately repels ice, he can also throw a physical shield, so the only moves that he can get hit with are almighty moves. And I also have Messiah Blast, which consistently does over a thousand damage at neutral stats. With that in mind, I set Hallelujah as my partner again so that I can avoid the panic chance from Evil Gleam, and I make sure to have Yaksha in my active party so that I can throw up Tetra Card. Now, this strategy isn't guaranteed to work because I could still get wiped out with Almighty, which almost happens when he goes for Morning Star and follows it up with Evil Gleam. Luckily, I had enough Summon Stones to bring my dead demons back onto the field. Moving on to the topic of Messiah Blast, I can't express how absolutely important it was for this fight. It's literally the only thing that made this fight not take another grinding session. With all of this under my belt, it isn't too long until the Demon Lord is no more. For real this time. Steven shows up and informs us that the Beelzebub, Lucifuge, and Lucifer we fought was actually an illusion set up by Yahweh because of human observation or whatever. All that matters is that we can now move on to the second brain, which is just second verse same as the first, the only difference is the colors. We run into the silhouette of Jonathan, who says the same thing Walter said and disappears. And moments later, we are now fighting Azriel and Haniel, who also retain the skills and affinities they had in their previous battles. After defeating them, we have to fight Merkaba once again. Thankfully, unlike his demonic brother, he is very easy and goes down on the first attempt. You know, I feel like these fights should have been swapped. Upon stepping into the third brain, we are accosted by the one and only Metatron, who thankfully is nothing like his Nocturne counterpart. He does, however, still have Fire of Sinai, which can hit 1-5 to five times, and is severe almighty damage. But in the short amount of time it took me to beat him, that doesn't happen. When we defeat just the one, an entire Metatron whore comes out and you handle him the same way you did the first time. Unfortunately, I do get unlucky and get nuked with Fire of Sinai, but then I remember that he also has a weakness to electricity, so I equip the Baihu rounds and take my win. With that, nothing stands in our way between the 3rd and 4th brain, so after yet another agonizing hour of trying to progress, we finally get to a dead end where we see Walter and Jonathan transform into the beast with 7 heads and 10 horns. Satan. I'm not kidding, that's what the design is based on. Satan tells us that he can take us to Yahweh, but before he can do that, he's gotta test us to make sure we're worthy. As you would probably expect, Satan is no joke. He has Trisagion, Akasha Arts, and his most unique skill, Megiddo Art, a severe almighty attack to one enemy. Oh, and he also has all of these as well. The main gimmick of this fight is that he'll ask you a series of questions that you better answer wisely because if you don't, you're running the chance of getting fucked over. The first attempt goes okay, but in the end we do die, so I do a little bit of grinding mostly for my demons. While here, my Suicube learns one of the best skills that will make Satan and especially the final boss more manageable, Imposing Stance. What it does is it takes away an enemy's press turn, which may not sound good, but for this run, as I would soon find out, it's literally a requirement. After grinding, I head back to fight Satan for a second time and... Yeah, Imposing Stance is broken. Neutering him down from 3 to 2 press turns is invaluable. It makes me wish I had this for many bosses prior, but I'm just glad I have it now. Midway through the fight, we're asked whether we'll sacrifice ourselves or our friends to fate. I choose myself, which gets Nanashi killed, and then Sphinx gets killed with a concentrated Megiddo arc. I use Suiki Samurai Carbon to revive Nanashi, and unfortunately he gets taken out, but Nanashi is able to deliver the finishing blow to the devil himself. Now that Satan sees us as worthy, he transports us to the finish line where we hear the voice of God telling us to turn back. But we refuse and now we can take on the final boss, Yahweh himself. Before the fight begins, Walter and Jonathan split from Satan to join up with Flynn and Isabeau also joins them, knocking us down a partner. When the fight does start, you may notice that Yahweh has a resistance to everything. Well, the gimmick of this fight is that there are two separate teams, your team and Flint's team. Yours is literally just the same minus Isabeau. Flint's team consists of Flynn, Walter, Jonathan, and Isabeau. Every time a party uses all of their press turns, it will rotate to the next one. 
when the current rotation is on Flint's team, you need to use Flint's skill, Godslayer's Sword. It's an almighty attack that weakens Yahweh's resistances. Once the resistance is completely depleted, he becomes weak to whatever gets fully depleted. For example, if Flint completely depletes his force resistance, Yahweh becomes weak to force. One drawback is whatever gets weakened is different every time the attack is used. There is one other gimmick. As you progress the fight, the game is going to prompt you to send a partner forward to utterly roast Yahweh to oblivion. Hm. Not long ago, I had complete faith in you. Now that I've seen the world, however, that's changed. I see now that you spin lives to fool the weak-minded into believing they're your chosen people. Elitism leads to decadence. Nothing good comes out of pitying each other. Your very existence debases humanity. You're the unclean one. Especially Gaston. Now that we've discussed the gimmicks, allow me to show you his fucking moveset. <laughs> no, your eyes don't deceive you. He has 14 skills at his disposal. I'm not even going to bother explaining. You can pause the video and read it for yourself. The fortunate thing is that he doesn't start using half of these until the latter half of the phase. When he does start using them, if you aren't already using Opposing Stance, now would be the best time to start using it. Admittedly, he doesn't go for the dangerous shit too often, but then again, that's probably because of Imposing Stance. After we get out of the r slash roast me phase, we move on to the second phase, and oh boy do I have shit to talk about. This is where things get cranked up to 11. His skill set is somewhat the same, except... Oh no, oh god no. His infinite power skill is the most dangerous thing he has, not because it deals damage, but if you don't get rid of the plus 3 buffs he has, you can kiss your ass goodbye because anything he uses with them will 100% kill you. Yahweh is not fucking around anymore. He is pissed and is now trying to kill you. Anything he does to you should be taken seriously no matter how little damage you sustain. Imposing Stance, I feel, isn't even helping because of all these ways he can just end you. After failing two times, I do what I normally do, and go grind. However, I felt like grinding wasn't the solution this time around. The solution was to get lucky with Godslayer's Sword. What I need Godslayer's Sword to do is deplete two of his resistances, Gun and Physical. I know Physical isn't the most popular in this game, but my best demons are physical focused. I don't necessarily need physical and gun depleted in the r slash roast me phase. I need it in the pissed off phase because that is where the stakes are as high as they've ever been. And after many fails, I finally get what I needed. Before I start the fight, I set Gaston as my partner even though that runs the risk of him stealing press turns but his physical attacks do insane damage and can hit multiple times if he uses the right skills. We finish the roast beef phase in no time and get to the piss phase. When we do, we somehow manage to deplete Yahweh's gun resistance within a short time, so now we can start getting extra turns off of gun attacks and two party rotations later, he now has his physical resistance depleted, so now we can finally get 8 actions a turn, and Gaston can do insane damage with Gungnir. We get to the latter half of the fight where he starts using Black Hole, which drains our MP by a lot. Thankfully, we have a lot of MP restoratives. It's also here that he kills Suiki, so now I can't use Imposing Stance anymore, so I bring up Fenrir, who unfortunately gets taken out by Supernova along with Sphinx, but the assist gauge is full, and after that goes off... There is no truth to your ideas. The future you pursue is a fabrication. Cease this at once! Your so-called truth makes me nauseous. Enough of this, kid. Put an end to him with your own two hands! So the fair This ought to prove child's play for you. Show him our power! I shall see the stage just this once. 
Flaunt your magnificence for the sake of the people. You gotta tie this one up. Do it for the people of Tokyo. I believe in you. Don't let me down. Go, Nanashi! <laughs> Humans surpass gods and destroy even me, your creator. No, this is not the end. You've only led yourself further astray. Humans are weak. You cannot live without my law, my order. You but now, you've debased my truths, and so I shall slip from the minds of humans. Humanity will inevitably lose its way, and long for salvation. Then, you shall regret this decision. <sighs> When we return to Tokyo, Walter and Jonathan say their goodbyes and everyone has to go their separate ways to help repair the damage caused by the war. We see Nanashi and Flint statue in Mikado, Dogda thanks us, and then the credits roll. I am so glad that this run is over. This was a bitch to do and what I've shown is only three quarters of the shit I went through. I want to take this moment to apologize to you guys for how long this video took to come out. I know I said back in January that this video would be coming out in like a week, but I just had trouble coming up with what to write and how long I should talk about a certain part of the game without sounding repetitive. But the video is out now and I thank you guys for your patience. Well, that's all for me. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe to support the channel, and I'll see you later, my godslayers.